Ryan, University of Melbourne. Uh, this panel discussion has been set up as part of a continuation of the ongoing work and research through the Transforming Housing uh, Research Initiative here uh, through the Melbourne School of Design. Uh, David is uh, in Australia for a variety of meetings and presentations, but I think particularly uh, going to Perth as part of the National Housing Conference. Dr. David Paul uh, Rosen is the principal of David Rosen and Associates uh, from the US. Uh, he's a recognized authority in the fields of affordable housing finance, inclusionary housing, redevelopment, real estate economics, sustainable development, and renewable energy. He earned his bachelor's degree in political science from Columbia University and his doctorate in public policy from the Union Institute. He's a widely published author and frequent international and national speaker on affordable housing, uh, development economics, capital markets, and energy finance policy and practice. David Rosen founded David Rosen Associates, DRA, in 1980. DRA is an internationally recognized public policy and financial advisory consultancy firm, bringing state-of-the-art transactional expertise to affordable housing, renewable energy and energy efficiency, sustainable development, and urban revitalization. DRA excels in balancing the needs of communities with those of nonprofit and for-profit enterprises engaged in public and private partnerships. Dr. Rosen has led a national research effort funded, national research in the U.S. effort funded by the Rockefeller and the MacArthur Foundations to conduct a U.S. government-wide review of over seven trillion dollars in federal finance, tax, lending, spending, and regulatory programs and policies as they affect real estate uh, uh, investment and smart growth. Dr. Rosen uh, was invited on numerous occasions to provide briefings to the Obama White House and senior administration officials in half a dozen agencies presenting DRA's policy and recommendations. Uh, today he's going to provide us some insights into the different mechanisms, particularly financial mechanisms, for looking at affordable housing and affordable housing renting structures uh, in the U.S. So I'd like you to welcome David Rosen. Thank you, and I have to apologize to Carol and Rebecca and all of you for being tired here at a slight mishap um, with a tendon that was uh, not uh, cooperating. So I'm very happy to be here, and I'm going to try to stand throughout this, which is what I'd rather do. First of all, can I ask, can you hear me in the back? I have not been accused of being shy or having a, um, a small voice, so I'd rather do this without the mic, but you can hear me okay. Yep. Um, I want to, uh, uh, at, at Carolyn's invitation, uh, suggest um, five things to cover in this presentation. I'm eager to uh, exchange with my colleagues on the panel and with you in the audience. So I'm going to try to cover this at a rather high level, uh, and we can drill down into the details as we go. I want to first suggest that until and unless we define what we mean quantitatively by affordable <coughs> housing, we don't and can't have a policy. And my observation, imperfect as it is in Australia, is that you're not there yet. Uh, and so that's an important starting point. Secondly, I want to suggest uh, a comprehensive framework for uh, developing a strategy to um, design, fund, and carry out the development of affordable housing. Because unless we actually deliver units on the ground, again, we're kind of just talking to each other. Uh, third, I want to profile for you three finance strategies in the spirit of kind of filling a gap. Uh, uh, Walter Mondale, some of you may remember that name, is not terribly successful in some quarters, and others is very successful. Uh, in his presidential campaign, set up his opponent during the debate, where's the beef? I mean, where's the substance of your policy proposals? And unless we add capital to fill the gap, uh, we don't have any beef in our housing policy. Uh, so this framework is, is really a critical piece. And then I want to profile these three strategies and conclude with some lessons learned in six decades of practice in the United States. Affordable for whom? I want to start by suggesting that we need to define affordable housing by household income. And we need to do that in relation to area median income. And in turn, as a percent of area median income. Anyone know what the percent, or rather what the median income for household afford 
Metro Melbourne is? No one? 70. But yeah. Carolyn has a question mark on her face. <laughs> this is a time to worry. Yeah. Uh, remember what I said about the importance of defining affordability. Um, secondly, uh, we would do this as a relationship to household size. And uh, thirdly, we would then turn to the definition of affordable housing expense. Now, we're principally concerned with renters and owners. Certainly the homeless and those with extremely restricted incomes and severe social service needs are a special and imperative class of concern. I'm going to focus, simply given our time, principally on the renter and owner housing, but let's not forget the needs of the homeless and those with special needs. For rental housing, uh, in US policy, this is really established, I would say, in concrete at this point, after 40 years of practice. 30% of gross household income, that is, prior to tax, for rent plus utilities, adjusted for household size. For ownership, a little more malleable, given the malleability of underwriting criteria. Some of you may remember something called the subprime crisis, our gift to the world, <laughs> uh, where uh, we ignore these standards. Uh, but for affordable housing expense, I would uh, suggest 35% of gross household income for principal, interest, <coughs> property taxes, mortgage insurance, and if appropriate for a low down payment loan, property mortgage insurance, plus HOA. So the alphabet soup of PIT, IPMI, and HOA, I think there's going to be a quiz. 35% for mortgage, taxes, insurance, property mortgage insurance, and HOA. So what does this look like? Uh, there's a pointer right here. Yeah, the middle is green. Aha. Um, Merit Bill de Blasio, New York City. Anybody heard of him? No. Elected last year. Uh, one of the first actions on taking office was to craft a plan for House New York, Housing New York. 200,000 units developed and preserved in the next 10 years for affordable housing. <coughs> uh, defining five income levels from extremely low, quote unquote, to middle. I'm less concerned about the language we use for these labels, what we call them. Remember I said until we define quantitatively what we mean, we're just talking. We can't underwrite a label. Like, I can't tell you what your rent is going to be if you're so called very low income. But if I tell you that um, we're defining very low income as between 30 to 50% of area median income in New York, 83.9, I actually think Melbourne is kind of close to that. But I don't know either. Um, the affordable rent for this family is up to $1,050 a month, given that definition. So it's not that they can afford to pay nothing, it's just far below what the market rent is. This is a family of four and a two bedroom. Two bedrooms in New York are uh, the cheapest is 2,000 a month. So if you're getting into an apartment at 1,050, uh, you're well below market. Now you can see at the higher income levels, the affordable rents are, above, are approaching and beyond market. So we want our affordable housing subsidies to be uh, closely targeted below market. Otherwise, we're subsidizing the market and we're subsidizing people who could uh, pay rent or purchase a home at market rates. Doesn't make a lot of sense for scarce public resources. The framework uh, that I want to suggest here starts by defining our existing conditions in a marketplace. And now I'm really talking about a metro level. I see Gwenda here from MPA, and um, we had a, a very good discussion of this uh, on Friday at the MPA. What is your real estate market? Rents? Prices, housing supply, age of housing stock, need for reinvestment, bedroom count distribution, vacancy rates, competitive supply, prices and rents. Uh, until we know that, again, we really can't target our strategy, right? Secondly, what are the needs? And again, this needs to be quantified. And the standards we would talk about in the states include uh, how, what you call housing stress here, what we call uh, cost burden. It's really the same concept. You're paying too much, you can't afford what you're paying. Uh, so cost burden households for us are paying more than 30% of their income for rent or housing cost. Severely cost burdened are paying more than half their income for rent. We have more than 10 million households in the United States out of 110 uh, who are paying more than half their income for rent and who are below 50% of median income. So when we uh, cut that down to um, the top, uh, the bottom 40% of households, we're talking about one in four low-income households who are.
are severely cost burdened in the United States. That is a huge problem. Um, the gap, by this I mean an economic analysis of the difference in cost to deliver a unit for rent or for sale and what that person can afford to pay in rent or house price, given the definitions we just had here. So there's an economic gap there. And until and unless we craft a housing policy at the local, state, and federal level, I would suggest, to fill that gap of capital and new revenue, we don't have a housing affordable housing policy. Because we can't get there from here. Uh, and that, uh, then in the US, what we would do, and we've done scores of these strategies, is we would tally up. Remember that movie, Other People's Money, by Danny DeVito? Anybody recall that movie? Am I that old? <laughs> folks who are uh, the age of my children. Um, so Danny DeVito had this, uh, here at this comedy talking about using other people's money. It was a Wall Street comedy. Uh, in affordable housing, we should excel at using other people's money, local, state, federal, and private sector sources. So we really need to understand what we have in the bank now. In Australia, that's next to nothing, as, as I understand it. You have a class of maybe 3.5% of your housing as social housing, some 300,000 units nationwide. <coughs> Uh, undercapitalized, um, operating in negative cash flow. Right. Gee, we, we did that model too. It's called public housing in the United States. It's, it's, uh, it's very challenging. But it is a housing of last resort, serving the lowest income folks. A critical resource to reinvestment. <clears throat> so where do we go from there after we've reviewed our existing conditions? We establish um, a strategy to craft new revenue local, state, federal sources. And what I would propose to you would be considered as a permanent and annually renewable source of capital for reinvestment in the production and preservation of affordable housing. A housing trust fund, for lack of a better word. Um, funded at local, state, and national levels. Again, remember, we're now talking about the subsidy capital required to fill that gap. We need our private sector partners, but unless and until we can fill the gap, the private sector partners, who, including superannuation, who rightfully will require return of capital and a return on capital. So we have to honor that to invite them in as uh, leveraged partners for us in these capital partnerships. And secondly, and very importantly, at the municipal government level, excelling at capturing the value of land generated by zoning. We're going to talk about that in some detail. So once we have our category of new programs uh, for revenue, we then design who we're going to assist and how, who's going to administer those programs at the local, state, and federal level, and what their roles and expertise and capacity need to be, uh, who the partners are in that uh, strategy, for-profit developers, I see Rob here, uh, and others, non-profit developers. Do we have community housing developers in the audience? Okay. <laughs> Three? Okay. We need you guys. Um, Property managers for rental housing, uh, not a class I understand here, well-developed. Asset managers, lenders and investors. Um, and we need a strategic plan, just like a business would have a strategic plan of how to get from here to there, and a capital plan. So I don't know if folks work on infrastructure capital plans, but as we think about affordable housing, especially rental housing, as key community infrastructure, it's going to require a five to 10 year rolling capital plan of sources and uses like a development pro forma. Are folks here taking real estate economics? Yes? No? No. Okay. So we'll, we'll need those folks in the room too to run the development pro formas. You took development. Raise your hand. Um, uh, we need all those disciplines as partners in our strategy. Um, there are lots of types of new revenue. Again, my forgiveness for being late here, but um, briefly, a whole range of tax subsidies. In, in your kind introduction, you referred to the uh, Federal Review of U.S. government subsidies in real estate. It turned out to be $7 trillion. It was really an unbelievable number. People had not done that cross-government agency review before. And what we found was the vast majority of U.S. housing subsidies go to high-income persons for home ownership with very little into rental housing. It's really kind of a backward system, I would suggest to you. So one of the lessons learned is don't do that. Um, but 
That said, the tax system is a powerful tool to leverage real estate and that gap. Tax credits, tax deductions, property tax abatements, and GST exemptions for construction for a qualifying project. The GST, I would suggest, is a, is a modest subsidy. The credits can be quite substantial. And we'll talk about that in some detail. General fund allocations and appropriations of cash money, a concept. Uh, to be clear, we're talking about taxes and fees. So this needs to become a priority of the government. I'm, I'm certainly in no position to suggest uh, what those priorities should be in Australia. I'm simply here to say that unless you answer this question, you can't have a viable affordable housing strategy. This would include general fund allocations, impact fees like, is it Section 94 uh, for development assessments? Do I have the name right? I'm not sure. Uh, you're not sure? Oh, OK. Avoinda, uh, is it Section 94? Are those the assessments? Uh, 173. 173? OK. OK. Um, I thought in Sydney I heard that phrase. Maybe I uh, and the, the contribution of publicly owned land for development of affordable housing through ground leasing, air rights, and other structures. Bonds are long-term forms of debt that allow us to front-end investments in affordable housing with long-term repayments. General obligation bonds, revenue bonds, and other types of bonds. We can talk about them in the Q&A. And we need the private sector to provide uh, senior amortizing profitable debt mortgages and equity investments, again, with a return that's structured not unlike one of the programs we'll talk about momentarily. Oh, one thing I want to point out with the community housers in the room. In the US, foundations played a key role in building the capacity of the nonprofit community development sector in the, in the United States. And that was about a 30-year commitment. Uh, and today we have several thousand community developers who collectively have developed probably upwards of a million units of housing that are affordable rental housing in the United States. So very significant player, as you'll see momentarily. Could you talk about the place? Should I use the mic? Yeah. Oh, great. So I'm shy and I'm quiet. Uh, it's obvious. It should be. Is this on? Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, land value capture. Inclusionary housing, a percentage of market rate residential development set aside as affordable, hopefully in perpetuity, uh, for defined income levels. Development incentives to help offset the cost of such development. Does that work? Yeah. Does it make me look fat? <laughs> okay. Um, you can even put it in your pocket if you want. Okay, guys. Density bonuses, design code incentives like parking reductions on transit-oriented development to help offset the cost of compliance with a inclusionary housing obligation. Air rights development uh, over city-owned parking garages, parking lots, rights of way, transit stations or corridors, all represent development opportunities and value capture strategies. And a transfer of development rights strategy or transfer of um, floor area ratio, I think you referred to it as floor space ratio here, SFR, uh, FSR. Um, New York City has a very active trading market in density which is tied to a set-aside for affordability. It's more than a billion dollars a year uh, in New York City, so it's actually a big deal. We can talk about that in the Q&A here. You see. I'm going to skip uh, how regressive our tax subsidies are for home ownership in the US, and I want to move to what works. So the first strategy is the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. Other than Gwenda and Rob, who's familiar with this program in the United States? Yeah. Anyone else? So, enacted in 1986, uh, this is the largest affordable rental housing production program in US history. Uh, it basically operates by providing a tax credit to investing corporations for qualifying housing developments. 
that set aside units at rents that are affordable to families at or below 50% of area needed income for a compliance term of a minimum of 30 to 55 years, and importantly, must be occupied by those households. So it wouldn't do us a lot of good to say have rent control as we do in New York City, where the rents are restricted, but anyone like me could occupy that unit and benefit from the subsidized rent. That's kind of goofy. So this is an important uh, provision of the program. This program is $7.3 billion a year, U.S., on average produces 110,000 units a year. Now, 7.3 sounds like a lot of money, but putting this in the context of the United States housing policy, anybody want to guess how much the U.S. spends on mortgage interest subsidies for home ownership, which is regressive in its distribution? 90 to 100? 90 to 100? I have 90 to 100. <laughs> 600. This six hundred billion, no. What? I, heard, I, I thought I read somewhere it was actually quite quite a lot in the seven. Yeah, 100. Rob's right. It's quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> like, is that an Australian expression? Yeah. That's that's an Australian economist speaking. Yeah. It's quite a lot. <laughs> Two hundred billion. Seven billion for the low income housing tax credit for rental. Two hundred billion for the mortgage. And the home ownership rate in the U.S. sixty three percent. And in Australia, with no interest deduction. 67%. What are we paying? About 1,500 projects a year. More than 40,000 projects have been developed. Importantly, more than a quarter developed by nonprofit community housing development corporations. And equally importantly, three quarters developed by for profits. So this is clearly a profitable, positive cash flow enterprise for very long term, very low income, affordable rental housing. The default rate, I'm sorry, the foreclosure rate on this portfolio of 2.6 million units is 0.56% for the period 1998 to 2010. That's through two recessions, including the Great Recession. A better performance rate than market rate rental housing as an investment class in the United States, which represents a trillion dollar market in the United States. Here in Australia, it represents about a zero dollar market, and we need to talk about Uh, I'm mindful of my time, Carolyn, um, so I think I should go a little faster. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to skip over the structure, which is boring, complicated, and confusing. Uh, suffice it to say that it takes time to become comfortable with this structure and to drive down investor returns, which in the beginning of our program in 1986, 87, 88, 89, were obscenely high, 30, 40% internal rates of return to the investor about 50 cents on the tax credit dollar into the projects. Today, we see a dollar to a dollar 20 per dollar of tax expenditure with almost, with, with about 95% tax credit efficiency. 95% of the cost of the program goes into the housing. It, it, it's a highly effective and highly disciplined market and we, we can talk about how it works. I'm sorry to be Uh, I want to talk a second case about redevelopment tax increment financing. Is this a similar, a familiar concept to folks in the room? No? Okay. So um, I think we're holding, was that a question or yes, it's familiar? Well, quick question, are you sharing the slides today? Uh, Carolyn and Rebecca have them and they're available to you, yes. So, and uh, leave me your card or I'll give you mine and I'm, I'm happy to share. They'll be up on the Transforming Housing website next week. <laughs> Did you want the mic for that? <laughs> it's I, nice to be with a skilled... I don't need no speaking <laughs> mic. Yeah, I, I don't need no speaking mic. Right, exactly. Where I feel really small. Um, redevelopment uh, and tax increment financing. Redevelopment is uh, a tool for financing the repositioning of real property in a defined area, a project area. Uh, it's used to remediate blight to help incentivize economic development. What was the name of the project area we talked about on Friday? Fisherman's Bend. Fisherman's Bend here in Melbourne would be a classic redevelopment project area site. Uh, we're going to talk about Canada Bay and Roads East in a moment in Metro Sydney, another classic potential area. It's, it provides an ability to enter into public and private partnerships. 
and it uh, is conducted by agencies who typically are corporate instrumentalities of a city government, whose balance sheet is separate from and not representing a liability on the balance sheet of, or a general obligation of the local government. It provides enormous financing flexibility using this tool, tax increment. So what is tax increment? It's the increase in property taxes within a redefined project area that results from increases in assessed value over time. So remember that it is not an increase in the tax rate. I mean, think about Melbourne 30 years ago and what was here in terms of real estate and its assessed value. Uh, let's just take the CBD. And think about were we to walk outside and look around and what's here today. And think about the difference in assessed value and the property tax collections off that increased value. And you immediately can sense the power of tax increment financing. So tax increment captures a portion of that increment. Uh, and it's, it, to be clear, it's not a free lunch. So it's a redistribution of property tax revenue from <coughs> other taxing entities into redevelopment. And hence, you want to be mindful of that. Um, Again, it is not a new tax, and it is not an increase in the, in the tax rate. And it's the primary source of funding used for a strategy in California, my home state, where we developed more than 100,000 units of low-income housing with tax increment financing. Um, the increment results from increases in assessed value through new construction, major rehabilitation, transfers on sale, and other assessed I want to jump to an illustration here, and then we'll move to the third strategy and the questions. So this is a 30-year clock on property tax revenues in a California city. You can see it starts in year 2007 and runs to 2037. The vertical left-hand scale is annual revenue and property tax collections from the city in the project area. Make sense? And you can see in 2007, annual collections were how much? just under three million a year, and projected to go to how much in 2037? Seven. Close to seven, more than double, right? So you can see the red line is the projected increase in property tax collections, no new tax rate, right? <clears throat> so in 2002, this city issued a bond, a tax increment bond, or tax allocation bond, which took how much of the 2.8 million in revenue? 1.8 million? for debt service. So a million eight in debt service over 30 years produced about 50 million in proceeds, okay? Uh, and you can see represented only two thirds of the increment. So you had very high debt coverage for remaining debt service, which either could be shared with other taxing jurisdictions or provide the investors in the bonds like superannuation funds comfort that there's adequate coverage to get repaid even through economic cycles, right? And then, uh, that wasn't enough for this city, so in 06 they wanted to issue another bond, and you can see the orange uh, issued uh, slightly more. Now you see it steps up here in the first four years, you see that? So that was keeping a debt coverage relationship to the red line. And it was two tranches, the senior debt service and the subordinate debt service. The second tranche, senior, uh, generated about 30 million in proceeds. And the third most risky subordinate tranche, another 10 million. So this jurisdiction created 80 million in proceeds from tax increment bonds, which it used to invest in the development and construction of low-income rental housing in the city, leaving ample debt coverage for other purposes in the jurisdiction. A very powerful strategy. Statewide in California, at its height, 450 redevelopment agencies were collecting $6 billion a year in cash flow. And by statute, 20% of that needed to be reinvested in low-income housing production. 1.6 billion a year. It was the largest state program for affordable housing in the United States. My last uh, example today is value capture. We talked about the importance of this strategy for affordable housing in addition to capital. And I mentioned uh, Canada Bay. Anybody familiar with Canada Bay or roads for that matter? <coughs> Okay, uh, so you know that today there is a high-rise new development in Canada Bay that was built off, I think, uh, Dow Chemical had an Agent Orange plant. Again, our gift to you. <laughs> we're, we're such great exporters of wonderful things. 
Uh, well, um, that land was cleaned up, and it's a gorgeous, amazing community. The high-rise units uh, pulling down about 2.2 million a year. Uh, I'm sorry, in sales prices, hardly affordable. The city council in Canada Bay has made it plain that they intend, with the redevelopment of Roads East, uh, which represents uh, actually with uh, discussions with New South Wales planning and environment, more like 4,500 units, not 2,800 units, at build-out. Their intention to set aside a portion of those units as affordable under an inclusionary housing requirement. And so a comparative example would be the downtown plan in Long Beach, California, of calculating and quantifying the value of so uh, the downtown plan in Long Beach called for 5,000 new units of housing, a uh, million five square feet, we're not in the metric systems, that's about 150,000 square meters, of office, some retail, about 800 uh, new um, hotel rooms. The plan provided, in, in addition to the increase in density, developers certainty about their entitlement rights. Developers, if anything, crave certainty. So to the extent a jurisdiction can provide that, like the Rhodes East plan, that's highly valuable. But in addition, they reduced parking requirements. They conducted a master environmental impact report, which is a planning document that provides the approvals to proceed. Not only paid for that, but again, injected the certainty that the project would proceed if at the new higher densities, which resulted in um, savings in permit processing. So we were retained to ask two questions. Uh, to quantify the value conveyed to developers and landowners of the um, densification, the opportunity, and determine the extent to which, if at all, a portion of that value uplift could be reinvested in affordable housing and community benefit production. And so we did an analysis looking at four land use types. Apartments, we call them condominiums. I think you call them strata. Uh, home ownership units and multifamily buildings, yeah, you call them? <laughs> See, that's very confusing to me. You call them apartments. For us, an apartment is a rental unit. So what do I call it? An apartment? What do I call a rental unit? <laughs> okay, you see why I'm confused. Yeah. Okay. Um, I need to learn to speak Australian. I can't even order coffee here. I mean, what is it? A long black, a short black, a flat white? <laughs> there's a course in that. I'm complete. There's a course in that. Would yeah. you sign me up? <laughs> so we looked at those four land uses. And this is a critical slide. Um, uh, I, I gather no one's studying real estate economics here. We need to bring in real estate economics into planning if we're going to conduct land value policy in a thoughtful and market savvy way. Land residual value is the holy grail for development economics. It determines whether or not to proceed with a project by developers, lenders, and investors, and I would suggest planners should take this course as well. I'll trade you the copy course, <laughs> the land residual value course. So it calculates the development potential of a project. Let's say this room was a high rise apartment project <laughs> um, by determining the revenue potential of the sales of the apartments and subtracting the cost of building the project and providing a profit to the developer. And that subtraction gives us the value of the underlying land. And this is done in a very disciplined and fine-grained analysis with quite accurate analysis of the costs in the market, right? So if it's a negative number, is the developer going to proceed? No. Is a lender or investor going to extend capital to build it? No, they shouldn't. Uh, but if it's just about break even, what about then? Would the developer proceed with that? Hmm? Yes or no? No. Because it's, it's too risky. Right, we're, we're, uh, it's, it's uh, a small increase in costs, uh, the cost of Chinese steel, for example, or the cost of construction interest, throws the pro forma negative, uh, the developer's on the hook for completion guarantees, too much risk to give it a green light. Um, so we need to see a land value that's close to the current trading value of land in the marketplace for comparable parcels. So I really commend this slide to your memory. This will be on the test. So I'm going to uh, um, quickly review this slide one more and then, and, and then open it up. Um, I do want to take a minute with this slide. What are we looking at? So the purple bars 
on the vertical scale to the left show the increase or decrease in land value for that prototype, and this is apartments, based on the rezoning in Long Beach, based on development costs and rents and operating costs in Long Beach, um, at different densities. 4.0, 5.0, 8.0, FAR, FSR, uh, and different heights, 80, 150, 240 feet. And these are the same because they represent highest and best use for this parcel, so the economics would be driven by the highest and best use. The purple is market rate. The green is a requirement that 10% of the apartments, the rental units, uh, ownership units, be affordable at families at 50% of the area median income, very low income. Okay? So what's the increase in value conveyed market rate to the rental developer by the rezoning in 2011 in Long Beach. How much per square foot? Can you read it? $60. It's actually about $65 a square foot. Now, let's require that 10% of those units be affordable at 50% of area median income. Does that drive the pro forma negative? No, it does not. So it is still profitable, admittedly less profitable, but you can see that the uplift in value is about $15 a square foot, adequate to provide certainty for the developer. Remember that we calculated these net of developer profit. Okay, so that's already included in the pro forma. This was a very powerful finding for the city. Now, we looked at office buildings, and it was a very different story. So office rents in downtown Long Beach, and by the way, it's tied to downtown LA, about a 30 minute ride by light rail. That was the trigger to rezone downtown Long Beach. And you can see that uh, the market rate project is barely feasible, meaning it's really not feasible. The, the margins are too narrow to proceed. And if we layer on a $10 a square foot fee, this is a fee, not a rental unit because it's an office project, it drives it steeply negative because of the uh, uh, economics of land residual value regulation. But look at the hotel, another commercial project. And here we have very high land values for the hotel, north of 120 bucks a square foot, increased value. And after the $10 a square foot fee, almost $100 a square foot more. This suggests you could layer on a $20 a square foot fee and it'd still be quite profitable. The result of the analysis, oh, one last piece was, we looked at the savings per square foot of those incentives, parking reduction, EIR, environmental impact report and accelerated processing time, you can see that accelerated processing and the cost of the impact report was negligible, immaterial. But the savings for reducing parking when it costs $40,000 of space to build that parking <coughs> were material. And that represented a very important um, savings incentive for developers in the plan. With this analysis, we determined that 15% of those 5,000 market rate units could be set aside as affordable to both very low income renters and moderate income homeowners. So uh, what do we need uh, for a successful program? We need to define our terms of affordable housing. We need to quantify our needs in the housing gap analysis. We need to commit a permanent source of capital funding to fill the subsidy gap. And we need to be very astute about land value capture strategies in our zoning. And in the U.S., we've learned that we need a national consensus on defining affordability. We need to create this permanent source. We need to create durable public-private partnerships. So if we are to treat especially rental housing as key community infrastructure, we're going to need to build up institutions here in Australia that we don't currently have and build upon the capacities of those that we do. For-profit developers, community housing developers, housing authorities, lenders, supers, and the like, and implement a, um, a state-of-the-art value capture. For rental housing, this means if we're to treat it as key infrastructure, we need to create an industry supply chain that can deliver it, own it, operate it, and manage it, hopefully for uh, in perpetuity, and not to have uh, limited affordability restrictions where the housing then converts to market rate, low-income families are evicted, and we have to replace to go from there, requiring permanent affordability. In home ownership, my last slide, the, um, we haven't talked a lot about affordable home ownership. The idea here is that we're putting folks into home ownership 
well below market prices, so there's a gap, right? And so the question to ask yourselves is when we do that, are we giving Carolyn, who won the lottery with that unit, the opportunity to turn around and sell the unit for a windfall profit at taxpayer expense? Was that a biased question? <laughs> or are we providing Carolyn an intermediate benefit of home ownership, amortization of your mortgage, increasing the, uh, levels of area immediate income, what happened, increasing in price, uh, and allowing you a stepping stone to the market when and if you can afford it, and allowing another family like Carolyn to come in at the next moment. So with that, I'm eager to hear from my colleagues. Once again, my apologies for this. Uh, So, just as a quick introduction, uh, many of you, certainly within the Transforming Housing, know Heather, but Heather has a PhD in history from the University of Melbourne. Uh, she has worked in housing and homelessness and tenancy sectors since 1989 as a frontline worker, uh, senior manager, network coordinator, board member, and public services officer. She has undertaken research into housing and homelessness, including a PhD thesis on historical aspects of homelessness in Victoria. She has contributed to key Victorian, uh, Victorian housing and homelessness innovations, including the coordination of all services, transitional housing standards, data, rights-based approaches, and sector training. Heather joined Home Ground Services in 2009, which, is a, which was a housing agency working in inner, northern, and southern Melbourne. She was the CEO until recently. Heather is now the deputy CEO of Launch Housing, Launch Housing is in fact the merger of uh, Home Ground Services in Hanover, which took effect in July of this year. Launch Housing is one of Victoria's largest providers of housing and homelessness support services, providing flexible specialist services that directly assist thousands of men, women, young people, children, and families each year. I'll also just quickly introduce Terry. Uh, Terry Romsley uh, is a principal at SGS. He's also the national leader for economic and social analysis at SGS. Terry is a renowned economist who provides advice to all tiers of government, not-for-profit organizations, and the private sector. He is Australia's leading thinker on the link between urban productivity and microeconomy and is a regular media, media commentator on the functioning of our cities and regions. He is a prolific writer, producing regular research papers and contributing, contributing to academic debate across a broad, a broad range of topics. He was the co-author of a chapter in the book, Australia's Unintended Cities, looking at the link between urban structure and productivity. His experience includes policy, public policy development, economic modeling, examining social exclusion, strategy development, detailed economic appraisal, and statistical analysis. His advice is highly sought from economic development, land use, transport strategies, and individual infrastructure. So I'd like to welcome both Heather and Terry to join with David. And we'll begin, uh, if we might, I don't know if we have a, we have a microphone. So well, uh, if Heather might have some comments on David's presentation or on some aspects in terms of its relevancy, particularly here in Melbourne. Okay, thanks, thanks, John. Thanks very much, David. Thanks, everyone. Everyone okay with the sound? Yep. Okay. Um, well, I mean, sitting here as um, as a Victorian who's been trying to get this sort of thing happening for for a long time, um, my first and foremost thought is, um, how did they do it, and how can we do it? I suppose. Um, I would just remark, make a few remarks about that. Um, as Don uh, introduced me, you know, I'm with Launch Housing. Uh, we've, we've gone through and are going through the pains of a merge um, in order to scale up. Uh, and I think we've all got to think scale uh, when we're thinking about housing. 
Um, so we now at launch see around 15,000, uh, 16,000 people a year. That's still only a portion um, of what's happening out there. Um, the other thing I'd sort of say in that space is that we are probably a little tired of being left with the problem or the sort of sense of being left with the problem. Um, and I think that's been a complicated relationship that the community sectors had uh, to homelessness and housing affordability. I think we've, to some extent, brought some of that on ourselves, actually. We haven't kind of been forthright enough. We haven't had enough of the sort of conversations with uh, planners, financiers, um, treasurers, uh, federal uh, people. Uh, we've, we've thought small. And um, we're part... I won't take the whole blame here by any means. But we are, we are part of why we've sort of got this kind of predicament, I think. And a predicament it is. Um, I dare say you're here because you think so too. Um, but it absolutely is a predicament that we've got. We seem to have a few of the elements starting to line up that might help us in this space. Um, I've just, I'm on the Community Housing Federation of Victoria um, board, and Chufolf, as we're marvellously named, there's another piece of Australianism, um, has uh, just hosted the Treasurer for a, for a networking breakfast. Uh, Treasurer Tim Pallas of Victorian Treasurer seems to seriously be interested and quite knowledgeable about af affordable housing. We've just had the Plan Melbourne discussion paper released. I see Ros Hansen here. Uh, affordable housing is woven throughout it. In a, in a, and what we mean by affordable housing as well. So we're starting to get there with the definitional aspects. Um, and I think we're starting to get there, at least at the state level, with some of the, um, the will to do something aspects. Um, and it's enormously helpful to have uh, people like David uh, come to, to Australia and talk about how it can be done. Because uh, there are some different elements, but fundamentally, uh, mobilising capital uh, to, some, to do something is, is not different. Uh, as far as I see it, that's not my area. I'm boning up on it as quickly as possible. But, uh, you know, that, there do seem to be some real lessons that we can learn. Um, but I suppose my comments <coughs> are how we kind of get that will and, and the engagement to, to start building such a thing. Well, I think what's been most effective in um, the United States at the local government level to build the will is when you're in the process of defining what we mean by affordable housing. Remember I showed the Bill de Blasio slide and the income levels and the labels. So these terms are actually statutory terms in the US, extremely low income, very low income. And they're, they're not particularly helpful because they are laden with stereotypes about <laughs> gangbangers and uh, drug addicts and, you know, we have low-income senior housing projects and by the neighborhood reaction you would swear that they're all ex-gangbangers uh, living in uh, frail assisted living for <laughs> the elderly. Um, so I think a real important connection is the wage levels and occupations associated with those definitions. Key workers such as nurses, public safety officials, teachers, retail clerks, hotel workers. Um, we've even seen cities do movies, videos, and slideshows uh, featuring real people from their communities who are in those uh, wage classes who are either identified by name or by their category. And you, you see the person, and these are your neighbors, your children, your parents, your coworkers, your employees. And I think that helps the recognition among policymakers that uh, this really is part of a sustainable, viable community and something we need to attend to and move beyond the unfortunate stereotyping, negative stereotypes of the labels. Absolutely. Terry, you're an economist. Uh, I'd be interested in your responses to the sort of economics that were presented, particularly in an Australian context. Uh, David, I really enjoyed your presentation and I found it incredibly pressing. The pressure comes from that all the various mechanisms you described are very well understood in the States, uh, but here in Australia we have none of those essentially in our toolkit. And part of it is a um, pushing off responsibility from federal, state, local to the head of the year, working away on it. Um, and that's where I think we've really got to start to start this narrative about what is affordable housing for? Is it at the lowest 10% income? Is that for those teachers, firemen, nurses who often talked about? And how do we try and develop some of these tools in the toolkit and pull them out? Because the real key is about you know, the residual land value, which everyone should be very much across. It's saying, well, you have a project which is a bit marginal, um, 
is there a value capture mechanism we can use to help get the development over the line? Or is it a more of a traditional social housing here which would require government subsidy um, to make that happen? And just pick up one of Heather's points, it's about how do we get scale? Yeah. Obviously in the States you're a, a 300 pound gorilla, uh, whereas in Australia we're very much undeveloped. I resemble that remark. <laughs> <laughs> and it's important um, for the conversation in Australia how we keep talking about trying to attract private sector capital and the super funds, you know, get point things at them to be a source of funding. The real issue for them is a, a lack of scale. I'll give you a couple of examples. I was talking to some nice uh, international investors in Sydney a few weeks ago. They'd gone and raised $8 billion for investment in urban infrastructure and equ in equity. They'd gone and got another $12 billion in debt, so $20 billion they wanted to invest in housing, roads, rail, ports, airports. And they're asking us at SGS about the Bayes Precinct in Sydney. And we said, oh, look, this is all site here. You know, we could, it could be three or four hundred million dollars worth of development for you. And they actually physically recoiled at that number. Not through it being too large, but being too small. They want projects of a billion dollars. And when you start talking about a billion dollars, you can start to uh, tickle the boxes from a commercial feasibility point of view. And then you can start to talk about what's, what's the issues with the split for affordable housing whatever that looks like. And the same thing for the super funds who might have $20 billion under management um, run by actually quite small teams. It might be 30 people looking after investment scenarios. So for them to give Heather $10 million would create a whole headache for them, a risk profile for their financiers and their, um, their members. So it's really how do we get a billion dollars, which people have, and in the current uh, global environment, thanks to the subprime prices, thank you, um, trillions of dollars <laughs> looking for yield, looking for a return. You know, people parking money in European bonds and paying the privilege for it. So there's all this money floating around. We've got to try and get it into affordable housing in Australia. And um, David, can you solve that problem for us in the next 15 minutes? Uh, well, thank you for that. <laughs> um, you know, you're both talking about scale, and I think. Uh, I think that's really right-minded. Um, it's so much political pain to address what at the end of the day is either a tax expenditure or a tax subsidy, a tax or a fee, right? To adopt, that unless you are doing it at scale, it may not be worth it. And you actually touch upon a, um, an issue with regard to capital markets and institutional investors. To get to scale, we do need the participation of institutional investors, and we need to provide originators of uh, debt, in particular, a liquidity um, a vehicle. Uh, and when you have a super fund of uh, 20 billion under asset run by, as you said, 30 analysts, uh, a single project at a couple million dollars is just not gonna register. Uh, so what that suggests is, in addition to the political conversation, about getting the elected leaders to identify this as an urgent public need worthy of public investment. Because without paying for that gap, we're wasting our time. If we're not gonna get there from here. Forget the homeless. I mean, even uh, attending to those who are at 50% air and median income for rent. Um, so we need to begin building up the institutional capacity of the community housing sector I'm sorry, you're going to have to go to school on economics, or hire them, <laughs> or hire them, okay? Um, and uh, provide a, a track record of underwriting and performance. Remember I said the tax credit portfolio has a foreclosure rate of 0.5%. Well, that is going to capture the attention of your overseas investors. Uh, that's a very safe asset class, and their returns are going to be moderated because of its safety. But you're not going to start there, because people are going to view it as very risky because it's untested. So from your experience in the 80s, how, how do you, you talk about the rate of return going from 30% down over the years? How, how, what did you have to do to hold hands? And so uh, two things were critical to that. One was the Community Reinvestment Act, which is a federal statute that regulates banks in the United States <coughs> that says that because they're taking deposits from communities, and then, say, investing it offshore, that they must reinvest a portion of their debt and equity, so there's a qualified investment test under CRA, in 
community benefits like affordable housing. That CRA, not Commonwealth Rent Assistance, but Community Reinvestment Act, that has proven critical. And while I think banks initially really hated it, it was adopted in the mid-70s, and it's really so standard now with banking practice that that helped drive yields down. I think the second thing that was important is it took some time to prove the asset class, to prove the business case. So I would expect your yields to start higher, but I would be insistent about driving them down through performance. And the third contributor, remember I had foundations on one of the slides? So foundations were key in developing the capacity, not only of community housers, <coughs> but in nonprofit equity funds who aggregated corporate investment and tax credits at lower yields. So you had nonprofit funds where the investors were earning for profit yields, but the syndicators were not taking outsized returns. So I think those three things, and a mission driven institutional investment class, um, proving the business case over time, and having some um, syndicators who are managing these investments so your 30 uh, asset managers can have time to think about it uh, with limited returns. David, I wanted, I wanted to ask you about the research effort that you undertook, which uh, discovered the $7 trillion uh, in support and subsidy. Two, two parts to it. One was, it says that it was funded by the Rockefeller and the MacArthur Foundation. So I guess one part of the question is, where did that emphasis come from if it was a foundation that was suggesting the research into the government agencies and the sort of overview? And the second is, when the sort of numbers tumbled out, what effect did it have in a recalibration or reproportionment of where that money could go to and who it could go to? Uh, <coughs> fascinating question and story. Um, the foundation's agenda, and uh, our, our client was a, a nonprofit called Smart Growth America, which kind of um, uh, betrays the agenda. So the agenda was actually not low-income housing, it was smart growth. And it was the idea that, uh, it was asking the question, is federal fiscal policy toward real estate, writ large, steering investments into the suburbs and away from revitalizing and connectivity in the inner cities. I'm using the term inner city here as I think you do in Australia. For us, inner city used to be a really pejorative term. But that's also changing, so I think there you're much more enlightened than we are. So uh, by hiring DRA, we brought the income distribution question. Remember I mentioned it's highly regressive, and I, I skipped some sh slides which are actually pretty shocking, but they're in the presentation. Carolyn and, and folks can review those at their leisure and ask about it if they like. The reception was twofold. Uh, even in the White House, folks were stunned at how much capital was affected by federal policy. They were just blown away. No one had ever previously aggregated all of it. It was like the fable of the blind man and the elephant. People know that. Depend, your description of the animal depends on what part of the animal you're touching because you can't see the whole thing. Um, for the affordable housing folks, they also were stunned at the regressivity and the imbalance, owner versus renter, but not surprised. Um, for folks who hadn't thought about affordable housing, I, I would say it was, it was very eye-opening. The political response <clears throat> if you've been reading about politics in the United States in the last six years, uh, we haven't been able to accomplish very much. Uh, I suppose there's a lot of money to be related to that. But the sacred cow of mortgage interest deduction is so politically important that even a bipartisan, bipartisan presidential commission, which called for refinements, couldn't uh, even get out the door, uh, let alone get uh, legislation passed. So that's proven very problematic. Uh, interestingly, we're turning to some states now, California and New York, at the state income tax level to address this issue. The California tax expenditure, remember I said it's $200 billion nationally? In California alone, a state a little bit larger than your country, and with an economy much larger than yours, uh, spends $10 billion a year on this one deduction alone, and virtually nothing on long-term housing. So, um, I think given giving up on Congress and moving to the states is one strategy that advocates for adopting. We 
don't have too much more time. But maybe Heather, if there any, if you have another question or comment you'd like to propose today. Just you referred to syndicators. I was thinking um, it's something like some sort of stock exchange. You know, we all, we, all, we also need to kind of get in place, don't we? Where we're kind of brokering the different parts um, of this. Is there some such? I mean, you've got your what you refer to as syndicators, so, um, the sort of uh, equity and Right, so, so uh, the syndicator role in uh, the provision of equity investment into low-income rental housing is central to the low-income housing tax credit program. And that role is a, principally a credit underwriting role, uh, a capital aggregation role, and an asset management role. So the underwriting looks at um, your project proposal and gives it a thumbs up or thumbs down based on its uh, financial integrity, its ability to perform over the long term, with positive cash flow and projected returns to the lender and the investor. The asset management role is one which assures compliance over the 15-year credit period. Uh, that's a credit period where the investor is held liable for tax recapture in the case of non-performance, a critical element of the law. <clears throat> it also helps dispose of the investor's place in the project partnership at the end of the compliance period in a way that is cost-free to the project and assures its long-term uh, affordability. So you're really, uh, my understanding is for affordable housing, certainly you don't have that here. I don't know if for other limited partnership vehicles it is common in Australia. Yeah. Really, okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's really an intermediation role and it's, it's, it's a role that I think you're going to need the investing corporations could do it on their own and have some capacity. So the banks certainly have some capacity to underwrite. The supers have some, but as you indicated, uh, and as I appreciate as a former trustee, uh, you know their uh, staff capacity is, is limited. But that is, remember I talked about the supply chain needed for key community infrastructure and rental housing? That intermediation uh, role is or part of those that I think. We have maybe two minutes. So, Terry, do you have any last uh, comments or questions? David, being an international expert, how do you think, from what you know of the Australian context, how do we sit into the English speaking world? Are we in the middle of the pack, end of the pack? Are the places you can work are at the end of the pack. Yeah. I, I agree. Uh, you know, I, and I say that as a newbie and uh, certainly without professing expertise in the Australian market, but you know, having spent the better part of this year uh, looking at your debt and equity uh, instruments, the capacity issues, in, uh, and your statutory provisions, yeah, I, I think you have a lot of work to do. Yes, we do. <laughs> well, on that, uh, on that uh, not, not necessarily optimistic, but opportunistic. No, <laughs> well, that's an opportunity. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I want to. Uh, <laughs> On behalf of Transforming Housing, I want to thank Terry uh, Ronaldsley, uh, Heather Holes, and Dr. David Rosen for participating today. Thank you. And as, as Caroline mentioned, the, the slides of the presentation, including those that we had to go through uh, very, very quickly, will be up within a week uh, on the Transforming Housing website. Thank you again. Thank you.
So, so that's one aspect because I think with her, with Rickman in Melbourne in February next yeah. year, it's worthwhile to get him involved. Well, this is something that would yeah. interest Alan. So Alan is the head of Melbourne School of Design, and Mark, Mark, and, and Mark's just talking about bringing in um, uh, what's his and, name? Uh, Rick Bell, who's now the head of Design of the City of New York. Oh, okay. He'll be here in February for Design Summit Gov that we're running. Um, and uh, you know, it's in, this is an important conversation. I suppose one of the questions I want to ask David and also Rick is, 
yeah. what was what took it from nice to important to have for the house in the US? And then the next question is how do we build an accelerator process to do it in five years or thirty years ago? Which is taking but, that But HR New York is such an interesting yes. place because again that example of social housing being designed exemplars in terms of sustainability as well that you see in uh, uh, the melody and Via Verde and all of those really cool new projects. Um,